it's great to be chatting uh, virtually uh, with your um, with this audience uh, for this this webinar today. Thank you everybody for for logging in and attending. Um, excited to give you guys everybody an overview of uh, some of the things we've been building here at Revision System in terms of the camera family and and then some of the kind of applications we're seeing our customers use and then um, taking any kind of uh, follow-up questions and uh, hopefully this can spark some ideas for app imaging application challenges that you're facing in, in, in your work. Um, so without, let's see, diving in here. Uh, so, so just to give you guys a, a little overview of the technology that we have. So um, the, uh, oh, hold on, I know, I think, oh, bear with me some technical we're good uh i got confused by the page number so uh just a very brief overview on on a little bit about our image sensors what we've um what we've brought to market is is a image sensor that uh is essentially uh built along around these types of new newer semiconductor materials called colloidal quantum dots and they're essentially a a small semiconductor um a crystal if you will and we use those materials to form photodiodes and use those photodiodes to absorb uh, light that comes uh, into the into the photodiode, excite electrons and and turn and holes and turn that into current, and that current gets uh, uh, amplified by a, a, an array of amplifiers and a readout IC and and turns into an image. So in many ways, it's very similar to traditional image sensors like you might find with, the, for example, in a CMOS camera where you have an array of uh, silicon photodiodes detecting light and that being um, serialized and, and, and digitized and turned into uh, an image. The difference here is that we build our sensors directly on top of, uh, of an array of amplifiers without using the silicon material for any of the light absorbing. So all the light is absorbed in these uh, layers of colloidal quantum dots. And so this, this brings certain pros and certain cons for the kind of um, image sensors that we could produce. Um, I think uh, one of the things that, that's very exciting about working with this material system is that it allows us to scale to um, uh, very large areas uh, and uh, very um, small pixel pitches as well. So what we've done today with the technology is our, we've, our first line of products is built around uh, three formats of uh, image sensor. We've got a, a, a 640, we call it, uh, which is a standard DGA, 512 by 640, and then a 1 1.3 megapixel, and then a full HD 1920 by 1080. Um, and this is an image of uh, what, the, what the, one of our image sensors look like, and um, you know, essentially think of it as uh, as as a kind of a standard digital image sensor with um, uh, a sensitivity that broad that that spans both the visible uh, and and the shortwave IR spectral region. And so, what we're really excited about here at Supervision Systems is that we've we've taken those those three different um, basic uh, image sensor formats, we've built a family of cameras. And our, our really our hope and our intention was to build a family of cameras that uh, can be useful in industrial, primarily in, initially in industrial inspection and machine vision applications. So we've tried to uh, include a feature set that should help the camera uh, users and um, get up and running quickly and, and produce real meaningful data for their applications. So, you know, roughly speaking, our cameras fall into three categories. We've got our standard SWIR cameras uh, that I mentioned. Um, and then more recently, we've released a couple of uh, new additions to the family. We've got uh, what we're calling a laser beam compatible SWIR camera, uh, the, the L series. Um, and I'll talk more about use of that uh, camera in, in laser beam profiling applications in a few slides. And then we also have uh, a, a new product family we're excited to release, uh, which is the eSwear. So for us, the eSwear uh, in this camera uh, has a absorption edge cut off at around 2,000 nanometers, um, two, two microns. And then it has sensitivity all the way through that shortwave IR, through the near infrared, and even down into the early part of the UV, you can see. So it's a very broadband absorber. 
Um, I think on to the next slide. So yeah, I had I mentioned the wavelength bands, uh, and I think this is a, a nice little chart to show um, how how the the spectral sensitivity of our cameras compares to more traditional sensing uh, material systems. So in you know the CMOS over on the the blue end of the spectrum that we're all familiar with, um, uh, is, does a great job in the visible region and can reach out to about a mi one one thousand nanometers where, where the silicon um, band gap edge sits. And uh, but but as as we know frequently the the sensitivity in the near infrared in the nine hundred region for CMOS is is dropping pretty fast. Um, and then and then into the near infrared and then followed the, out into the sphere, we have in gas, which I think um, is up in, until our technology uh, came to market was really really the only the, 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 the biggest show in town for need, for people needing to do imaging in the in the kind of thousand to, to 1700 nan nanometer range. Um, so having this broadband spectral sensitivity certainly can provide um, I think advantages for some applications where additional information comes from both the visible side and the and the near and the and the swear uh, pieces of the spectrum. So um, I kind of touched on this on the previous slide. Um, pro probably folks who've been working in the swear spectral band are are familiar with in gas, and so it's important to point out that you know we're not. Um, it, we've got some some advantages and some some uh, I think some strengths compared to NGAS, but we also have some some weaknesses too. And I, um, so there will be shortwave IR applications where uh, this is just it's the technology isn't isn't a fit. Um, but we're, we're really excited to find that there's many many great great use cases where where this technology seems to work quite well. So as I as I mentioned, I'll just quickly trot through these. Uh, we've got very high pixel count. Um, as far as we know, we have the very first full high definition SWIR sensor available in the commercial market. Um, we, the technology, although today in our commercial products is at 15 micron pitch, we we really um, uh, are excited about the, the ability to scale to much smaller pixel pitches. So we've done some demos in, in R&D programs where we've, we've we've shown three micron, for example, and we're and we're fairly confident that the limits for the pixel pitch are uh, you know probably sub micron uh, region based on the way we manufacture our sensors and the and the way um, the uh, um, the, the, the way the, the electronic transport lengths and optical absorption lengths work in these material systems. Uh, I mentioned the broad operating spectral bandwidth. Um, just because of the material system and the manufacturing processes, uh, we, you know, we believe there's just a lower intrinsic cost than traditional epitaxial hybridization driven processes that you find in NGATS and, and mercury cadmium telluride and the likes. Um, one of the great things is that with this, these cameras is that we have no ITAR, no restrictions for global export, um, and so that can ease um, shipping this product to, to customers who may have sites uh, all over the world. Um, now, the, the minus here at the bottom is the lower optical efficiency. I'll, I'll show you in a, a few slides the quantum efficiency, that is the ratio of of incident photons to extracted electrons in our sensors is uh, lower than in gas today. Although we are we are working uh, quite hard to try to to bring that number up, and so there's good hope there for higher quantum efficiency in the future. So um, just briefly, many of these applications, and I'll show I've got some some pictures and some that we can uh, we have later in the deck that, that show these use cases. Um, many of them will be familiar to folks in the shortwave IR. Essentially, we, you know, I think where our cameras shine is where um, people have applications that there's there's a spectral signature. They either need they need to detect a chemical or detect moisture, or there's a, a additional contrast. You know, things that look white in the in in the visible might be dark in the swear. Um, and, and additional information can be gained by using that spectral region, and that's where, where it's really critical. Um, and so, uh, you know, the machine vision generically covers a lot of, of different types of applications, but they include for us silicon inspection. Uh, Martin had mentioned how 
silicon is transparent to the these shortwave IR wavelengths that these cameras um, can detect. So that that allows um, inspection through a silicon wafer, uh, either to buried features or or backside features that may occur in in stacked applications. Um, the instrumentation in photonics, which kind of plays into laser beam profiling, you know, there's a lot of infrared um, lasers uh, being used for a lot of different, um, both industrial um, uh, inspection and then and, and, and research and development. Um, lasers, you know, you know, abound, and so being able to see that beam with these cameras, uh, it, it can be very, very helpful, very useful. Um, Kind of changing gears, talking about surveillance systems, where you know you're looking at a broadband light source, you're outdoors, you're using, uh, you're taking advantage of the fact that there's different atmospheric transmission characteristics, um, multispectral sensing, chemical sensing, uh, some agricultural imaging. Once again, looking for contrast in in agricultural products, um, and and we're excited that we're at the early stage of looking at automotive applications for these cameras. Um, and considering what we we could do in the, in the consumer uh, um, mobile phone space as well. And finally, high, high resolution, high temperature thermography. Uh, these cameras are not good for sort of room temperature style applications that you'd see from traditional FLIR style bolometer imagers, but they're great for higher temperature, you know, 200, 300 C and above applications. So, um, some features of the cameras uh, that we're um, that we're shipping today is we have a, a TEC um, a temperature stabilization. We actually don't usually use this to run the camera very cool, uh, very cool, I should say. We try it more for the stabilization that you would find in, in many um, SWIR cameras. So we often have the, the set point for the sensor to be at 30 degrees Celsius. Um, so the, this this cooling note is maybe a little bit um, uh, of a typo. We're not really cooling that much. We're just making sure it's it's not running at, at 60 or 70 C because the noise will degrade at those temperatures. Uh, we've got full visible to sphere operating bandwidths. Um, we've got uh, both two two flavors of outputs: USB 3 vision and Gig E vision. Um, a, a number of lens mount options. Uh, we've got a list of SWIR lenses uh, available from our website. I'll talk a little more about that. And then we also send the cameras uh, with, a, with a fairly straightforward software GUI that uh, provides uh, users' ability to capture images and do command and control and stuff like that. So it's just uh, it's meant to get people up and running quickly. Uh, I th our thinking was that the SDK that we also provide would be the kind of software toolkit for people developing standalone software applications too. And finally, we have some um, pretty simple pixel non-uniformity correction tables that are built into the, the firmware of the camera. Um, here's a little more detail on some of the, the specifications of the performance. Here on the right is a is a quantum efficiency curve, and it really gets to that. I think it, it shows both the broadband response, which see 400 out to 1650, a little bit at 1700 nanometers, but also shows that the quantum efficiency in that red end of the spectrum is indeed lower than you would find in 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 gas uh, systems. So in gas is up around 70 or 80 percent quantum efficiency. We're down around 10 10 15 percent quantum efficiency. <laughs> And um, you know, just to get right out in front of that, what, what that does mean is that in-gas is ultimately more sensitive. So for really low light photon starved applications, uh, these image sensors will, will struggle. But what we found for industrial applications so often and, and many other applications, there's just there's just a, a, a surplus of photons. And and, it, and once you're kind of above the noise level of the, of the sensor, which is actually quite good then the image quality is fantastic. So I think anybody who looks at the QE curve and says, oh, I'm not sure that's going to work for me, I would, I would you know, want to understand or I challenge them to first say it's, it's worth trying because frequently you don't know exactly what the image quality is going to be until you put the whole system together, uh, even if it's a, a mock-up or, a, you know, a kind of a demo system. And then, and then the other point would be, um, uh, yeah, if you've, 
you know, do you have the option of turning up the light? You know, lights are relatively uh, inexpensive. <laughs> and, and so add in, add in a few more LEDs or add in, um, um, you know, more halogen light or ways to get more, more photons into the scene. So um, pixel pitch, frames per second, we've got, uh, this is for the 640 by 512, pretty fast cameras with uh, uh, selectable bit depths for um, the digital out, uh, deep, very fairly high pixel operability. Um, the cameras are a snapshot global shutter, that's important to point out. Um, we have an external trigger available for synchronization of the cameras with other equipment in a, in a production or inspection system, uh, a range of integration times that can be set. We actually have some firmware that can take this longer than the upgrade recently that takes us out to a, a, about a second through longest integration time. And then there's on uh, a firmware binning available, um, and uh, I, I, we think a, a good number of features uh, that are implemented on camera uh, for for um, getting getting the image uh, conditions and uh, suited for the application. Um, let's see uh, a little bit about our lenses. Uh, this is kind of a screenshot from our our website. Uh, I'd encourage everybody to go go take a look if you have a, a an interest or an opportunity. So we we have a, a list of lenses that we can provide, and uh, our applications engineers are happy to to work, work with folks to determine what lens options exist and are, are recommended for the application. Um, uh, suffice to say, it's exciting. There, there are more and more square lenses available all, all the time. And so there's, there's quite a, a good, good family of uh, lenses for machine vision applications now. Um, a little more on the mechanical uh, and environmental specs here. Uh, we have an operating case temperature that we spec from minus 20 Celsius to 55 Celsius, degrees Celsius. So I think that's fairly uh, robust operating range for most uh, industrial and even some outdoor applications. Uh, power consumption uh, listed here, DC supply range. We have a CE mark for regulatory, uh, for, for, um, yeah, for, for safety uh, compliance. And uh, what else do I want to point out? The, the power comes in as, along with a breakout cable for the trigger through a 12-pin um, high-rows connector. And uh, once again, we have uh, no license required. This is this uh, ITAR-free um, designation. Um, OK, now we can dive into some, uh, uh, one of my favorite parts, which is, which is the imaging. And this, I think this is a nice slide that says, you know, what, what, you know, this sometimes it's, it feels like this is an obvious point to make, but it's important to see these images. Like, what is the advantage that having more pixels, you know, uh, brings to, to an imaging application? And, and so this, you know, is a, a simple, but I think effective way of showing, you know, simply put for, for a given um, working distance from an object, more pixels gives you more, you know, more field of view. You can see more of the object. And uh, so, you know, flip that around if you want to, um, you know, trade off field of view for magnification, you can also um, get a lot more pixels in a smaller area by going to a, a more powerful lens. So, you know, higher, higher, um, higher resolution or wider field of view, both of these things can be enabled by having, having more pixels. Um, so uh, I think one of the places where that, especially that idea of having a larger field of view has really been uh, important for our customers is in, in the silicon inspection world where people are looking at um, wafers or dye um, uh, either after the fabrication process or, or midway through and, and taking advantage of the fact that you can see here in the visible region, these, you know, these dye, you know, they're, they look like pieces of silicon. They're, they're opaque, can't, you, the visible photons are not getting in there. But then if you look at a swear uh, illumination, if you're looking at photons that are beyond the band gap of, of the silicon material, you can see these buried features. In this case, this is a, a cavity of a ring for um, a kind of a MEMS uh, application where you've got two wave, bonded wafers uh, attached to each other with this with this seal metal seal cavity, um, 
and uh, and and there again, like when you're when you're looking at and thinking about inspection, being able to inspect more dye per uh, exposure is is really an advantage that just buys you throughput and buys you capacity. So I think that's you know one of the one of the selling features of this technology that we have is 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 the wide field of view. Uh, a little more on some silicon. This is uh, where we've uh, taken. Um, a, a higher a magnification lens, um, you know, like a microscope style objective, and we're looking through a wafer. This is through the the, the top side of a wafer, and this is a buried uh, backside alignment marks, and you can see the high resolution imaging and all, and all the clarity. And so this this can help for for manufacturing and quality control. Um, this is another neat application where instead of looking uh, at, at the dye from from kind of uh, uh, the bird's eye view you're, you're kind of pitching it on the edge and you're looking through the the long end of the dye trying to see cracks that are occurring uh, uh, in in the dye itself so cracks and you can see this is there's a small little five micron wide 100 micron long crack that's uh, formed here and uh, this is being illuminated from the back of the dye into the camera uh, using a, a, a sphere um, LEDs, and uh, so this is this is another place where you're really you know taking advantage of the fact that those sphere photons are able to give you information you're not getting uh, in the visible. Um, so that's a die edge for crack inspection. Let me page down. Uh, this is another example of that. Instead of a bare die, this is a die where um, bump bumping has been uh, performed. So this is sort of pre um, uh, pre attachment to to a, a circuit board. Uh, here too, looking for defects in the edge, looking for um, the, uh, the the defects that show up as light is 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 passed through that die edge into our camera. Um, uh, flipping the wafer again, many wafers these days, there's many products, memory products, um, uh, CMOS image sensor products where, where wafer stacking is happening, where wafer to wafer bonding is occurring, either for packaging reasons or circuit density reasons. Um, and, and so during this wafer to wafer bond process, voids can form. And, you know, in the visible region, with the CMOS, you know, you're not getting any light through. It just looks like a, you know, a black opaque wafer. But in the shortwave IR with one of our cameras, you can see like all of these, 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 these voids that are where the bond between those two wafers, um, you, you know, was not not as desired. You know, we 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 had this wafer bonded. I, I think this might be a, a particularly bad example of a bonded wafer, but it really does show you what what can be seen with these these um, cameras. Um, okay, I'm going to change gears a little bit, talk a little less about silicon, more about um, some kind of consumer packaging um, uh, applications we're seeing. Uh, one of the properties of, of Sphere Light is that many um, colored plastics are, are semi-transparent. Uh, they have much more uh, optical transmission for these longer wavelengths than they do in the visible region. So here's a neat application where, where somebody was looking to see, hey, we've packaged this product and we want to make sure that all of the, uh, the the candy was filled into all of the appropriate slots. And you can see looking, um, you know, with a standard visible camera versus a sphere camera with, a, with an LED backlight, um, <laughs> you can, those photons go right through that, that cellophane wrapping and, and you're able to inspect what, what's happening beneath that. Um, uh, we've got a couple of more examples of that here. I think this is an interesting way of sort of showing the the impact of lighting and and where the light is positioned. You know the the difference in the kind of data you get doing a backlight, which you see in the middle, and a and a front light, which you see on on the right hand side, um, and uh, diff, you know just diff, different information that that can be. Um, uh, acquired there and you know here too once again take we're taking advantage of the fact that um, many plastics colored plastics have, have transmission um, in it uh, this is one where the, I think the plastics were a little bit thicker uh, and we were trying to see what was happening with um with a with a with a, a zip ziplock seal that, that kind of a zipper seal plastic zipper um, 
underneath all of that, um, all of the uh, the print that's on the surface, the colored plastic on the surface. This is for these these dish pod, these dish uh, washer pods. Wanted to make sure that the both the vacuum seal and the zipper seal were present and complete. Um, kind of neat to see, you know, a great great example of the you know I think the power of um, uh, of these longer wavelength photons, sphere photons for plastics. Uh, we were using a, an Efflux LED backlight for that. That's that square square light you can see up back in the setup there and one of our cameras. So uh, moving right along, this was some outdoor imaging, thinking about um, uh, surveillance, safety, uh, maritime safety in particular. This was an example where we had a customer looking to use these cameras for uh, ferry boat operation. And uh, we were doing some imaging on the coast and uh, a big rainstorm came in and, uh, and, and really just obscured uh, the, the visibility across this inlet, this three kilometer inlet. And we looked down at the, at the SWIR camera imagery that we were getting and we realized that, wow, we were getting much better transmission through the, that rainstorm. And this is just a, a function of the particle size in the air and the wavelength of the photon and scattering uh, that occurs uh, as, as those photons move through those, that, those particles. Um, and uh, it, it's, uh, this, is a, this was an early image with one of our early 640 cameras, but uh, it, was, it was pretty, pretty exciting to see, see this kind of use case. Um, Here's another example of outdoor long range imaging. This is a summer day um, with some kind of classic summertime haze. Uh, this camera, one of our one of our colleagues was up on a, on a North Carolina mountain here, looking out across um, uh, across the fo a forest. And you off in the distance, about 20, 36 kilometers away, I was gonna say 23 miles, 36 kilometers away is a is a city line that is really quite visible with the SWIR camera, but it's just hard to make out in the visible region. And this again is an example of longer wavelength photons having different scattering properties off of atmospheric obscurance. Um, uh, oh yeah, this this is a neat picture. This is like thicker plastic. Now we've got a lot more plastic, not just the cellophane, but the, the you know all the plastic you would find in a thick uh, laundry detergent bottle. And we've got a backlight where now the liquid laundry detergent is absorbing uh, uh, a lot of shortwave IR photons because of typically where the water absorption occurs at around 14, 14, 20 nanometers. And uh, you can you see a pretty clear fill line with the sphere, and it's, it's much harder to make that out with the visible. Um, food sorting, uh, speaking of the water absorption, um, I think we found for food inspection, one of you know, those kind of classic use cases for sphere is wanting to use that uh, shortwave IR absorption of water in 1420. Uh, region where the water essentially starts to absorb and looks dark. This is a bruised red pear, and you can see, you know, where the fruit has been bruised under the skin of the the pear. Water has started to pool. It's it's more moist there, and that and the, the photons penetrate just far enough into beneath the skin to to be more strongly absorbed. And you can see that bruise very very clearly. Um, this, we have an, a picture of walnuts where we were using a very narrow 1200 nanometer notch filter to try to provide contrast between the, the fruit, the heart of the nut, and then the, the shell, uh, which in, in the visible, you know, shade, shades of brown are difficult to distinguish. And um, this, this, this nut, nut uh, sorting packaging company was, was excited to see that you could, you could definitely see more contrast and, and started to build an application around on doing a shell inspection with these wavelengths. Um, vial fill, you know, where you want to take a transparent liquid uh, in a transparent vial, for example, in pharmaceuticals or in medical testing, uh, where you might have like a saline or something like that. Um, the you know use it this this application that we have an LED backlight that's getting absorbed by the fluid, so you can see the dark 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 saline and then um, but being transmitted through other parts of the vial and you can do an inspection for, for the fill level and then this in this case we're concerned about having the label present and we're able to work through the label as well. 
Um, oh, it looks like we have uh, uh, maybe a little bit of uh, PDF uh, image drift, but but you get the idea here. So this is a this is an application in the mining industry where uh, um, the uh, uh, a mineral that's used in the production of potash for fertilizers uh, is being mined, and the concern was being able to distinguish um, good material from material uh, that uh, is uh, is actually kind of dangerous to the mining operation. It looks like a very similar color. Um, and but but can absorb moisture very quickly and and, and leading to dangerous um, uh, dangerous circumstances because of the moisture uptake it changes the stability of the material while underground and so uh, in this swear image you can kind of I'm trying to make out you, you can see these dark these dark veins are showing where the where the bad material is the white stuff kind of in the background and you can even see color contrasts. Uh, it's just different absorption properties, uh, distinguishing where the good material is, taking advantage of that dark water absorption that I mentioned. Um, and uh, yeah, I think this is this is an exciting application. I think mineral processing and mineral you know, sorting, certainly um, using the shortwave IR and, and more the extended sphere as much as the standard sphere up to two and a half micrograms, I think has been well you know, well known in the in in the satellite aerial imaging world for quite a long time for doing um, you know um, aerial uh, imaging for minerals, and so this is neat to see how that same spectral region can start to be translated to industrial op operations. In this case, on, underground. Um, okay, this is a neat application where uh, some folks were doing plastic welding. They were welding two plastics together using uh, a near infrared laser as the as the welding as the as the heat source, and needed to be able to uh, see a a near infrared absorbing uh, coating that they were using to enhance the uh, welding process. But with our standard visible cameras, they were having they weren't able to see this coating, and it was and but with one of our swear cameras, you can see an example where, you know, the, because of that absorption of that coating, we get a lot of contrast, and then that can be used as part of the, the welding uh, process. So um, most recently, I'm going to kind of um, change gears and talk a little bit about laser beam profiling. I think we've we've got a, a version of this camera where we, with the L designation that we have. Um, that uh, is suitable for laser beam profiling. It can, I think it can serve as, as kind of the engine for a laser beam profiling uh, system. Uh, and in fact, we're very excited that um, another one of uh, uh, Laser 2000's um, partners, a company called Dataray, uh, has in fact incorporated our camera into a new laser beam profiling product. Uh, kind of a little, little plug for Dataray here. Um, using uh, where where they are using that that sphere sensitivity for doing 1550 nanometer beam profiling. Uh, because of that broad spectral re range, you can use it for for many different laser colors. Um, and uh, we're also looking to do it. We'll do be doing the same thing for extended sphere product. Uh, certainly, more information on that to come. I believe they might even be giving us a, another one of these webinars in the future. So um, yeah, stay stay tuned. We're we're excited about data ray on that product. Uh, this is an image of hot glass. So this is where you're not using reflected light, uh, but you're using emitted light, thermal photons that are coming, uh, in this case, from glass that's you know, 300 to 400 degrees Celsius, using the different intensities uh, of light uh, to get information about the quality of the glass that had just been produced. Um, we have a video of this on our website of these hot glass bottles coming off of out of a furnace, and so you can see the same kind of imagery, but uh, real time with, with you know at video rate. Um, and and uh, we're, we're, this is a neat, neat application. I think high temperature, high speed thermal imaging is a, a really good fit for this technology, and it's one where many other technologies, you know, traditional bolometers, for example, really struggle with that with that high speed. Uh, trigger, triggerable put part of, uh, of a camera system. Um, let's see. Ah, yes, this is a little bit um, uh, where we actually we have a, 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 a customer in uh, Switzerland from in Bern, uh, Monsieur Kufner, who has been using these um, uh, 
has been using these cameras for you know looking at through the pigments of you know of of images of paintings uh, to look at um, uh, features that were put down by the artist beneath uh, that final layer of paint that, that, that the world sees. So you know you can see um, the sketches of the outline, uh, and they're and they're using these cameras in this in in this art history context to get inf more information about uh, the, the get, you know the artistic process and potentially you know people who were involved in it and and. Uh, it's it's really um, very interesting, and we look forward for for more more of these kind of images to to, to come out. And I think here too, this is a case where you know having more pixels, having higher resolution, is very valuable to this kind of application for larger canvases and for finer details. Um, and uh, if you go over to our website, we have a little uh, app, uh, you know, white paper on this, and it provides more information on on what was being done and and, and why and what was learned. So yeah, please please do take a look at that. Um, okay, we're coming near to the end of the slides. I know there's a lot, a lot of material here. Uh, we're excited about this one. This is a newer, um, kind of an emerging application for us. You know, we've, we've made these large industrial cameras, and so we never really th intended for them to kind of go into like a headlight assembly and a, or behind a, a windshield or, um, a, on a rear view mirror, but we can use them for getting information about what does this image sensing technology provide for new information in an automotive use case? So this is, uh, you know, one where we're looking at the difference between a visible camera and our camera on a foggy day, uh, providing contrast between objects on the roadway or in the vicinity near the roadway. And uh, we have a video of this also on our website that uh, I'd encourage you to, to go and take a, take a look at if you have a few minutes. Um, this is uh, some imagery from our extended sphere product. So this has this very broadband uh, response out to two, two microns. Uh, we've got uh, an image with a 1650 nanometer long pass filter. So this is, we're really just looking at photons from about 1650 to 2000 nanometers. Uh, and um, there's actually another water absorption band out at, at just past 1600. Um, 1690, I believe, and so you can see how black, how dark that water is absorbing. You can see the very different um, transmission characteristics of the uh, the aluminum and excuse me, anodization. Those are differences. And um, yeah, we're excited about this eSquare camera product because it is uh, high, as I said, high resolution and it's and it doesn't require any any deep deep cooling. So uh, room temper operate, operation is fine. So with that, I think um, we're coming to the end. I got over time a little bit. I appreciate everybody who stuck with me. And I think we'll turn it over to Martin who can help to um, field some of your questions uh, our way. So yeah, thank, thank you for your attention so far. And uh, 